Um, a joyful, happy Ju uh, Juneteenth. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so much to say, and um, I, I will just share a little bit about the context of this work for for me in this very moment. Um, right now, I'm in the midst of a rabbinic convocation with Jewish Voice for Peace, which was founded in response to Palestine solidarity work and intersectional organizing. We supported most recently um, Black Lives Matter platform and stood against Jews who criticized a few sentences about Palestine and, and thus, you know, with a whole amazing document, <laughs> Black Lives Matter chose to focus on one sentence um, and so we struggle a lot with liberal, the liberal approaches to anti-racism work in general and the failure to see the cross-sectional and global aspects of our, um, of our accountability to descendants of the transatlantic slave trade and also uh, to Palestinians and Muslims. Um, so I, I'm breaking from that meeting to join this webinar. Um, recently, I've been so inspired by this work and I have taken the reparations uh, work and reflection to various uh, Jewish communal contexts and some chaplaincy contexts uh, in Berkeley, California, now in Philadelphia, to try to create, according to the amazing structure set out, some steps for people to enact reparations. The next gathering that we're focusing around is August 10th, which happens to be a Jewish holiday or a, cer a ceremony. Um, and so we're, we're going to focus our time, which coincides with the national gathering in Ferguson. We are, it's, it's important for for me and I think for those of us in Jewish Voice for Peace to look at the harms within our own institution, to begin there, to look at those harms and to begin to um, respond to in, in a concrete way and especially in terms of satisfaction because there's so many microaggressions, so much inappropriateness or, um, in, in white Ashkenazi response to Jews of color that the harm, even people trying to do good, r repeat harms. Um, and so th there's an outside um, consultant that is first working with staff and board members. And one of the first things that was created was a rehabilita rehabilitation opportunities, healing opportunities for African-American and Jews of color on, on the staff and the board and in local chapters and also a decision to put resources into emergent, um, emergent communities, Jewish communities, which are principally uh, hosted by Jews of color and, Afri and descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. There are approximately, just for, in for your information, there are approximately 200,000 African-American Jews living on Turtle Island in the United States. And I think that community is often overlooked in this process. And so I, I want to lift that up and raise that up because um, Jewish people are part of a very old and traditional community that's over 3,000 years old and are struggling with the racism of the white community. Um, there, in, in thinking about reparations altogether, um, we have a traditional 2,500 year old process we call tshuva, which is a response to collect to massive collective harm, which we can draw upon to create a framework for doing this work. And in particular, on on our ceremonial day of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we're all gathered together in our largest in our largest uh, comings together. Um, and we are involved in public confession and reflection. Many communities last year and the year before have begun to read 
Black Lives Matter text as our prophetic text. So we have replaced our traditional uh, prophetic text with the prophetic um, writings that are found in Black Lives Matter and other, um, and this year perhaps um, Jim Foreman and other calls for reparation. So I'm very excited about that process. In addition, we are trying, we are striving to move toward um, a, a pledge to center the leadership and analysis of descendants of the transatlantic slave trade in every action that we take including the, um, the aspects of satisfaction and non-repetition of the harm, because we realize that we can't, that white Ashkenazi Jews cannot um, successfully do this project, even, even in those people who are engaged in it, all, the whole spectrum of activism without doing that. Um, we, I could go into, what that right. tradition is, but but I won't. I'll just say that um, that Jew, Black Jewish people experience a double harm of anti-Semitism and racism, and that is something that Black Jews have to cope with. And it's 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 a point of sensitivity that I would like to raise in our reparation work. And so I'm very excited and committed to. Uh, the process of of reparations and and what that looks like for us in and um, I know that this is just the beginning of the journey. And thank you so much for inviting me to share um, my experiences and the experience of my community in this process. Thank you so much, Lynn. And I just um, want everybody to know we don't we don't uh we don't have a long call, so just make sure that you know that we're like leaving space um for everybody and to get some of these questions and stories out. And um Asia, I guess you want to take it from there in terms of um getting into the questions or do we wanna get like a brief statement from all of our uh, panelists regarding June and the reparations? So we can um, move into the question. Okay, good. All right, and let's, can we keep it maybe at like a two, three minute response maybe? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess to all of our panelists, our first question would be, what is the significance of Juneteenth for you and your spiritual community? Panelists, did y'all get that question? Oh, you're muted. Minister Dawson. So is it for anyone to speak now? Yes. 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 Uh, Juneteenth represents liberation for, for us. Um, that, that's, the, that's the basis of what what we're here for it's it's a uh, and I, I speak from indigenous and aboriginal people of color um juneteenth is just an all-around liberation time that's what it that's that's the significance of it, it it's it's freedom it's it represents a, a moving forward and, and a leaving behind of of, of the past atrocities um, that have, that have been that have, our people have been plagued with it's um it's a rebirth and that's how i look at it, it, it it's a it's a coming of it's a coming forth of newness and it's a rebirth it's a a new stance for us as as uh as black people in america Minister Dawson, since we have you here, um, one of the questions for you as an individual, um, can you comment on um, 
traditional medicinal traditions that um, have helped people to reconnect sort of with their ancestral roots? Is that for me as well? Yes, it is. Say one, one, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um, so the question is about uh, when we're talking about healing and reconnection for Juneteenth, can you tell us yes. about some of the um, traditional medicinal ways um, that have been called to bear on these processes? So you're talking about traditional ways in which we heal to bring yes. to move forward. There are mm -hmm. many ways. There are many ways to heal. Healing depends on the ailment, basically. So I, Juneteenth deals with <coughs> trauma, slavery, uh, racism, things of that sort. To go to the root of that would be to go to. It, it it's a it's a twofold thing. It, it deals with our understanding as. Africans, and it deals with the understanding of the, uh, the, the white people who, who actually did the enslavement. So the, the two healing processes, they, they would be kind of, they would be different. This is, what my, this is what my talk is on today. It's about what we call the marasa, or the balance, the, dual, the duality in life. So to have one out of balance, to have anything out of balance is, 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 is detrimental to the, to the moving forward. So if you have, um, how can I explain this to you? To, to kind of, the, the Marasa are the divine twins and one represents the masculine principle, one represents the feminine principle. They're divine twins locked in an ever loving uh, duality, basically. That's how the universe works. It's a dual, it's a du a dual natured universe. That's what we say is as above, so below, uh, light and dark, uh, right and wrong. Uh, it's all in how you perceive it. So in order to balance this out, because without balance, you have nothing. In order to balance this out, in order to heal, there are many different ways in which you can do this. Uh, Healing is healing takes place through spiritual work, which is uh, uh, let me calm let me calm down let me calm down. <laughs> because I no seriously because I'm 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 excited and I'm a little bit I'm I'm trying to answer your question in a in a cool, I'm trying to answer your question in the right way. And I don't want to get into too much of what I, what I have to present first. So you know, healing just takes place on, on, a, on, a, on a basic level. You have to go back to the root of what happens. So if you go back to the root of what happens, uh, <clears throat> you can, you can uh, the process would be either a shamanic process where you would take the soul back for soul retrieval. Like I'm gonna just answer it blatantly. You, you can take the soul back for soul retrieval or you can use some sort of physical type thing. You can use herbs, you can use uh, crystals, you can use a, a system that we call divination. That would be probably the best type system, the system of divination. And what, what divination is, it's a communication between yourself and the, the, uh, the spirit world, the ancestral world, or forces of nature, basically. That's, mm -hmm. part, of, that's part of my story. Um, you would ask the spirit world, basically, what is the root cause of what's going on here? And they would give you a remedy on how to correct that issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Minister Dawson. You're welcome. Um, Jody, I wanted to, to, to call you to answer these questions as well. I know that you um, do specific work around um, peace building. And from your perspective in peace building, um, where do you see the peace building work um, 
in regards to sort of the, the celebration of Black liberation? How do, how do those things work together? Um, hey, family. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because in the field of peace building, I don't consider myself a peace builder because there's often a focus on the kind of international context of peace building that doesn't address the history and legacy of colonization. So I want to be able to name that there is a need in what is considered the, the field of peace building to be able to tap into Black liberation, um, Black liberatory practices, um, readings. You know, I think that there is an emergence of that beginning to happen across many peace building programs because the specific field of restorative justice and its popularity. And so um, I call myself a restorative justice practitioner and healer because I think that is where I'm best positioned that often peace building um, does not focus on, on the healing that needs to happen through the body of folks, right? And there's often a way that peace building sustains the trauma, um, the violence and the structures that continue to be in place in communities as peace builders kind of do their work or go on their voyages. Um, so I wanna be, I'm very hypercritical, I think as someone who has, you know, went to the Center for Justice and Peace Building to name that there is a need um, for black bodies to be made visible in the field of peace building. I think that's one that often we are invisible because we are focusing in on black liberation and it, pushes folks to hold a mirror up to themselves, right? That it's no longer about what's happening over there, but also what's happening here. And that whatever is happening here, folks are bringing with them as they're engaging with other international communities. And so there, so I, I think for me, um, continuing to be critical of the field of peace building to name that there is a need for black bodies to be made visible. Um, and also for the wisdom of black liberatory movement and writing um, and healing and practices um, to also be made visible through the curriculum of different peace building programs and institutions um, that continue to give us primarily like white male authors to tell us what liberation looks like, what conflict looks like and how we transform that. And so um, I think there's a need for it and um, there is an emergence of folks wanting to know how to engage in that, and I think that is particularly because the rise in restorative justice, um, not in the ways that we've been given restorative justice as something that is just about like what harm happens, but really create, providing um, a space for folks to dream about that other world that they wanna create. So we often talk about the world, but we don't create enough space to dream about it. Um, with some structures that's like very much intentional, right? Um, to maintain the kind of powers that still exist. So I think a lot of it is just pushing the feel around the visibility and the wisdom of Black liberatory work, movement, ceremony, practice, um, and to be and to also ask a question, um, especially as someone that wasn't born in this country but raised in this country, to also ask a question like, what is the relationship between liberation in other places in the diaspora and you know, with like African American communities or how we define and name that, right? Like, what is the arc of that? Like, how is our liberation founded? Even if we don't um, vocalize it, right? To be able to, to see and recognize how those things are interconnected and related. Hopefully that answered your question because I totally forgot what it was. No, um, that was that's actually, where I am. <laughs> that was perfect. I, I wanna, um... Ugh, I want to say all the things about the dreams that we're sort of dreaming for our liberation. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull in um, Dr. Zahora Simmons, um, thinking about sort of these intersectionalized bodies. Um, we had Rabbi Lynn telling us about the Jewish Black experience, and uh, Dr. Simmons has a lot of um, research and work in the area of Islam and Black Islam. And... Um, Dr. Simmons, I was wondering if you um, can can speak on um, sort of that uh, that intersection and um, where and what sort of these these liberation movements in the United States kind of mean for Black people throughout the the diaspora. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm now unmuted. Okay. First of all. Uh, 
greetings of peace to everyone uh, on this webinar. And thank you so much uh, for uh, hosting this important event. Uh, I'm a little thrown because, of course, I got the questions that you had sent, and those were the questions I had been thinking about, uh, as well as, uh, you know, putting together my opening comments. So uh, this question that you've just given me, uh, I, I kind of need a little time to think about it uh, because um, I certainly have not uh, sensed that within the Black Muslim community, uh, the, there's talk of reparations. And so that certainly is something that I would like to see uh, brought to uh, that community. Uh, while I am uh, a practicing Muslim, uh, as an activist for all these years, I have been very involved uh, with the Black church uh, and the activism that grew out of the civil rights movement and its connection with the Black church. Uh, so that I am not finding that even in the Black church, uh, that there is a focus on reparations. Uh, I think that, I don't know if I'm still on, there's a lot of different things happening on my link here. Can you hear me? Yes, and if, okay. you, all, um, if you all who aren't speaking can, can mute so that um, yes, we can hear. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, as a person very involved uh, with uh, the Dream Defenders, uh, uh, the Florida-based uh, group that's really came before Black Lives Matter, uh, and many other groups working on the critical issues impacting our community uh, at this very moment, I am not finding that reparations is something that is being talked about or focused on. Just this weekend, I was at a conference on prisons. Uh, it was a national gathering that convened here in Gainesville, and it culminated in a demonstration outside of, of the county jail here in Alachua County where there are, and this is a small community of about 65,000 people, yet we have 700 uh, mostly black men and women locked up because they can't pay bail. And so we had raised some money to get some men out. So my, my involvement with movement people, uh, people in the black church as well as in the activist community, I am not finding that this issue has gotten on their radar by and large. And it's something that I think we absolutely need to do is to pull people who are already working on the uh, dire effects of our enslavement as black people and the uh, uh, years since the Emancipation Proclamation and all of the legal and, and not legal things that have been done to undermine us as a community, uh, that we have to put reparations on the front burner for many of those persons. Uh, I do work with uh, white uh, activists uh, in the women's movement, in the peace movement, uh, and certainly now very much in the electoral politics uh, arena. And again, this is not an issue that is in the forefront. Uh, I think the fact that some of the 
people running for the presidency uh, for 2020 or talking about reparations means that we really can uh, get this on their agendas. And I think the hearing I gather is happening today in Washington on reparations yep. is another way in which uh, I think we can uh, get more people thinking about and focusing on this. I think given that I was involved with SNCC, uh, I knew uh, Brother Jim Foreman personally. He was one of my mentors. Um, and I know that at one time, this was a major issue, but I think it died out in the thinking of many Black activists in light of the uh, racism in our society, which is so intense and particularly now under the Trump administration. I don't think people had been thinking about this, and this is why I'm so happy that FOR reparations uh, group is putting this forward. I think the fact that it's the Fellowship of Reconciliation, uh, a mainline white peace, majority white peace organization, uh, the fact that they're spearheading this is very, very important. Uh, Thank you. I, <laughs> Can you hear me? You was just waiting on me to drop it. I see you. Thank you. Hi, will somebody please mute their phone? <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Speaking. Hello, am I now muted? We can hear you. Okay, so basically that, that those are my comments in response to the question you uh, gave me, Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wanted to. Um, call on Miss Bonita Lacey, um, who also does a lot of organizing work around people who have been formerly incarcerated, um, as well as bailing out Black mamas. Um, Miss Lacey, the question that I have for you is um, thinking about sort of dreams of reparations um, as we are entering into our period of reflection. What what would the future for imprisoned Black folks or formerly incarcerated Black folks look like um, sort of in the presence of, um, uh, in the presence of, can't hear you. Well, did you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you now. Okay. You, you went out question? on a question. Did you want me to introduce uh, what Juneteenth meant to me and then answer the question? Or how do you want me to do that? I would be not yes. Okay. Somebody needs to mute because I hear a lot of talking in the background. It's not me, you all, this time. <laughs> okay. What Juneteenth mean to me? Bottom line is. People start talking about Juneteenth represents a void for me. It's supposed to be a happy time, but it's a reminder of unfulfilled spiritual freedom, spiritual and psychological freedoms of our people. And uh, although we have celebrations, it reminds me that there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm not going to But the um, that's I want to be clear. It's not just about a check. Correct. When I think of, um, I think of about. That? Okay. It reminds me of unfulfilled spiritual and psychological freedoms that we have not achieved with that uh, your free deal that we got from the government. Uh, it m reminds me that even though the young ladies and the young men 
and some older that we get out of jail, even though that they are free, they're not free because freedom starts to me and it always have in the mind. So if your mind can't be psychologically free, you don't have the freedoms to think, to feel, you, you live and walk through life with a depression that you don't know why it exists or with a, a lot of times for people who come from prison, a feeling of feeling less than that they can't explain because that record always shows up or is always on the forefront. So for me with reparations, I would like to also put on the table that we erase the fact that a lot of us have um, situations what we've been through in prison, incarceration, jails, et cetera, and that we look at each other as um, a people versus the circumstances. So we fight for the circumstances to change, but we want to keep the people whole. So that's what I see with, uh, with reparations for people who are coming out. Um, for myself personally, it would be building generational wealth, building business. I love building business and, and helping people to see something more into their spiritual self or what they really want out of life rather than settling for what they can get because of their circumstances of going to prison, et cetera. So for me, it's building the person back up to a whole person on the inside and connecting them spiritually that God got you. And I believe in God. <laughs> so um, a lot of people, uh, when they get in prison or incarcerated, they be like, where's God now? So when we look at the spirituality of it, when we show up and when we showed up to bail out moms and uh, to do our activism work, a lot of times, that chatter that she talked about is not um, said in the larger, a broader sense, but in my world where we're on the front side of, of movement building, um, we know that is um, we spread out the information and then we do the swell and we hand it over because as she was speaking in my mind, I was thinking, okay, they're in a small town, Gainesville, they're, they're bailing people out. Okay, we did that five years ago. So, you know, you got people working on all types of levels. And when it gets to the uh, individuals that haven't heard it, that's part of that swell. So we are just conscious of putting it on, putting it on the table and allowing, like, now we have our um, Democratic nominees are the people who are running to be a president. We have them talking about it. But I must remind people from my perspective, other than Kanye's, the person who talked about it was a white woman, Mary Ann Williams. And she really talked about it, you know, prior to the presidential aspirations that she have. Uh, and I just think that as we spread it, uh, spread the word from congregation to congregation, and we also teach people who want to know but are afraid to jump all the way into the surface because they feel like they may have like liberation people who will just you know pound on them i think that there's some work to be done in uh educating uh, white congregants and white social justice ministries how to approach those grassroots organizations you know they may want to they may have always wanted to but they didn't know how without feeling like they're jumping into a circle where you know they're going to be uh best etc but you know as we move forward we need everybody on board uh as much as we can to counteract those things that i'm hearing now oh what are they going to do with the money if they get money well first of all if you're far, so far behind the first thing you got to do is catch up <laughs> that's number one so that to me is an irrelevant question which is spirituality because people have they have unfulfilled um, financial needs. People, you know, barely keeping their houses. And, and from the people I've spoken to, and I speak to people, black people on the ground, who are poor people who haven't heard about reparations and haven't heard about the um, conversations that we're having and the conversations that's been had in uh, DC today around reparations. I'm asking them, what would you do if you actually had a financial gain? Some of them say, the first thing I do is run the church and say, thank you, God, thank you, God. So there, the spirituality is there. You know, um, a lot of them are saying they would pay off their houses. A lot of them are saying they would invest, you know, monies into their grandchildren or their future generations. They want to, a lot of people want to go back to college, but they don't go because they, 
the circumstances that they're in does not allow them to go and, and have that self-fulfillment of a college, a basic, uh, whatever college education that they want or have desired and have had to put aside because of, you know, life itself and the oppression and people going to jail and them bailing them out and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my, uh, my view of Juneteenth is a reflection of the work that has to be done, celebrating how far we've came, but then really create getting in spaces where spiritually we all on um, a really focused win, a really focused win, because I've seen in the movement and since I'm at the beginning of building, I've seen in the movement where we, we think about what we want the end result to be, but in the middle it gets watered down and then it gets morphed into something other than what it intended in the first place. And I wanna uh, always put that on the table that we stay focused on reparations spiritually, et cetera, but yes, also with uh, financial means because uh, being depressed or being spiritually, we've been had 400 years of that trying to build up our spirituality as well and to keep us held, held together as black people. So that's my uh, view on it. Whoever has to speak has to unmute themselves or Asia has to unmute them. Or hold your hand up. Thank you. I can't hear you, Asia. You're muted too. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so what we want to hear from um, all of the panelists really briefly is um, I want to hear you describe what the future is like when reparations is present, when this process has been completed. So we'll start with um, Aurora Harris. like what the fuck hello everyone um just to repeat that question again um we'd like to hear from all of you um beginning with miss aurora harris about what the future looks like when reparations is present Ms. Harris, are you here? Okay. Um, we will move on to Ms. Jessica Benjamin. Text Asia or Dave. <laughs> Okay, you can't unmute. Okay, I got that message. I was able to choose that fucking email, girl. Like, mute your fucking shit. You have a. Five minutes. Sorry, everyone. Okay. We're having some technical difficulties. I was. Am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you so much for asking me to uh, participate and uh, be part of this, uh, I think, incredibly important 
meeting and process that I hope will continue for a long time. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit surprised because I didn't know this was the question, so if it's okay, I'll sort of blend it in with what I was planning to talk about, which was that uh, I have uh, some personal experience with thinking about uh, a part of what the reparation issue, which is has to do with what is called satisfaction and also non-repetition. Uh, and that is based on the idea of acknowledgement, on apologizing and on trying to create a different kind of understanding that allows people not to keep repeating. That is to say, in this case, white people acknowledging what they are responsible for and also thinking about how to not keep repeating, how to change the structures. So what I imagine is not so much the reparation process when it's complete, but what it will be like for people to really get involved in making reparation as part of a solution to a problem that they know they feel guilty and responsible for, but they have been helpless in some way to do anything about. Uh, and now I speak, of course, of people who know that they're guilty and responsible. I'm not even talking about the people who don't, but I think that number of people increases the more that the people who do know it become active. And uh, in working uh, in the situation in uh, the Middle East with a very profound and uh, spiritually evolved leader, uh, Ayad El Siraj of Gaza, to try to create dialogue around the Israeli occupation and acknowledging the problem of uh, the occupation between in groups that involve both Israelis and Palestinians. But where we're really clear that the acknowledgement has to come from the side that is uh, the more oppressive side. And at the same time, we're aware, and, and we saw this in South Africa too, which uh, I have had the chance to visit and talk to people who were in the Truth and Reconciliation there, that it's very important for people who are, um, people who are oppressed and victimized to realize that they have some power uh, to uh, call to those people who need to, uh, to change, to acknowledge, they have a power to call to them and remind them that uh, our humanity, all of our humanity depends on recognizing each other. Because I think a big piece of what, uh, what uh, white people don't realize is how much they're actually suffering from knowing what they've done. And uh, so I'm really interested in how we create conditions for people to start to realize what they have done and how to change that. And uh, I mean, that's sort of my work as a psychologist, but I also would like to say that for me, this call for reparations means that there's something for white people then to answer. You know what I mean? Like, so I see it as a kind of a dynamic process. Uh, the more uh, we listen, the more we try to hear what people who have suffered because of our history uh, are going through, the more we're able to witness that, the more I think we can be spiritually energized uh, with our own compassion and our own desire to become more human. So this is sort of what I've learned from doing that kind of work. And it's not, um, it's not based on the idea that uh, all sides are equal, that everybody is just trying to reconcile, sort of what Jody said about peace building. It, you have to be profoundly aware that there's a, oppression, that there's been uh, domination and subjugation of a whole people. But I think it's really important that we not forget that the people who are uh, feeling this guilt and this responsibility, they need an avenue to make this reparation. And I'm really interested in how we can make that happen. And I hope that we can join together to, uh, to do that because it will not only heal uh, in the sense of uh, making things better and different for those who've been oppressed, it will actually change our whole country. And that's what I see happening, is that it will change our whole country from 
being a place where somebody always has to suffer, somebody always has to be put down into a country where people really understand that we can be together as equal humans. So that's my... Panelists' response has kind of sparked a question that I think we sent out to everybody. So I'd like to hear a little bit from everybody on this. In terms of getting this work done, what do you guys think people? What is it? What is it that people fear about reparations? And I'd like to hear from all the panelists on this. What is? What are the, some of the stumbling blocks that are keeping us um, from getting through this process? Hello? Were all the panelists able to hear that? Hello? Hi. Hi. We can hear I'd you. I'd like to speak to that. Yes, is okay. it possible? Yeah. Yes, um, please. Okay, this is O'Hara Simmons again. Um, first of all, there are many reasons. Uh, there is tremendous, tremendous ignorance. And first of all, let me just uh, affirm uh, what uh, you have just said Jessica Benjamin, uh, what are the things that keep us from our society from making reparations um, to the African American uh, descendants of those who were enslaved, uh, to the Native Americans who basically there was a genocide against them? A uh, big part of it is uh, ignorance of what was done, and this is purposeful. Uh, as a person who has taught for 20 years at a major white, majority white institution, uh, I find that the students know nothing about the history of their country. Uh, and this unfortunately is true for the African-American children as well as the white children with whom I have spent these last 20 years. So of course, this is purposefully done. We know, and I'm engaged for the last five years in a struggle to get African-American history taught in the public school system here in Alachua County. Uh, there is tremendous resistance to teaching the real history of our country. Uh, the other thing is, as was said earlier, we live in a society where there are winners and losers all the time. And uh, there is uh, this idea that if you give one group something, the other group is going to lose. Um, and so we're dealing with a uh, long history of the people of this country being kept as ignorant as possible of what in fact has been the reality of the development of the wealth of this country uh, on the backs of enslaved Africans and of course all that was done post-slavery to keep black people at the bottom in every uh, area, economics, uh, education, housing, et cetera. So this is purposely done by, you know, one group calling them the 1%. It's certainly more than the 1%. Uh, but this is uh, purposefully done. And this is the great work that we have to do in terms of, as a beginning, is the truth part <coughs> of truth and reconciliation with reparations in between. The truth must be told and taught uh, to as many people as possible uh, before we can, I think, turn this country around so that it, uh, at least a significant number of its majority population understands that there is a sickness uh, of the soul, of the spirit that has come with the uh, white supremacist teachings in this society thank you I'd, I'd like to speak on that as well okay mm -hmm. we're listening can you hear me please do. yes 
I, yes. I believe I believe that it's fear itself, basically. Um, when you have a people that have done so much to another people, when you have so many atrocities that have been done, the fear is that once those people get on their feet, once those people are able to do for self, that in turn they will then, you know, seek seek uh, retribution or seek uh, some sort of the the same uh, atrocities against you know the person that oppressed them. I I believe that's a that's a heavy burden that uh, that white people walk around with. I, 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 I truly believe that. I think that they're, they're, the shame that, that they hold and, and the guilt that they walk with is part of the reason in which, in which reparations is being held up. Now, one of the other panelists spoke, and I agree with her, that uh, you have to take accountability for what's been done. Uh, in doing so, when you take accountability for that, there, there's, a, there's a spiritual thing to that as well. You're taking on a, a ton of, of, of spiritual energy that, that was done against like, not, not just what you do today with, under the umbrella of racism, but what you do, what, what has been done in the past, the atrocities that have been done in the past. So that's like a floodgate being open. And I don't know if everybody can handle, you know, what, what that comes with. I mean, families were ripped apart, uh, a bunch of, you, we know the atrocities, many things have happened. So to open that floodgate, I think that's the fear. The fear is, ooh, do we really want to accept this? Do we really want to allow that floodgate to be open? And, you know, are, are we strong enough to stand in that and to stand in the truth of what has really been done? That, that's, a, that's very deep. It's very deep when you think about it. Um, I also wanted to touch on one other thing. You, you asked what, what reparations look like. I think reparations is healing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a total healing for black and white. Um, like I said previously, the, uh, the, the, the gift, so to speak, or the uh, what, what you get from reparations needs to match the atrocities that have been, uh, that, that have happened to the people. And that's that, that is so, it, it's so heavy. So that is the only way in which true healing is gonna happen in, in, in America. We have to come to a point where we say, you know what? Um, we acknowledge that this has happened. Uh, and, we want to, you know, we want to turn the corner. We want to make it right. And, and just a financial gain is not what makes it right. Like uh, the, the mind has been affected. Families have been affected. Uh, the family structure has been affected. Uh, the spirit has been affected. All of these things have been affected from slavery and racism and, and, and white supremacy. So the totality of it is astronomical. It's, it's, it, there needs to be, that's why I say we need to go to divination to truly find what the, uh, what the answer is. For me personally, it looks like land, I, land we need land from reparations. We also need, um, we also need some sort of financial uh, payout and I, I like the idea of business, free loans, no interest-free business loans and interest-free housing. Interest-free, uh, being able to purchase your home, interest-free. I like those things. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a start. But, you know, like I said, the atrocities that have been done, the, the payout needs to match the atrocity in order. That, that's a spiritual law. That's what I was talking about earlier with balance. You can't give, you can't do something so horrendous and then say, okay, I'm going to give you a couple of dollars and think that it's going to, and think that it's going to balance out. The universe will not allow that. It'll still be conflict. That's why we have so much conflict in America right now, because there's no balance. When, when, when your body's out of balance, that's cancer. 
when your mind is out of balance, that's a mental health issue. America is out of balance right now. And reparations is the is the the pill, <laughs> the pill, so to speak, for healing. If we, we we can get back in balance, but you know, something dynamic needs to happen. That's my two cents. Thank you, Minister Dawson. Um, real quick, I think I would say um, around fair, particularly white folks, I think two things. One, white folks are constantly performing whiteness. Even white folks who are organizers or, or in what's considered their work, like there are still ways in which folks are performing what whiteness is supposed to be or what whiteness is should, should be, right? Because like there are privileges that folks receive so they can be allies and pop out at any moment, but maybe not co-conspirators and accomplices, right? So I think I always just name that for white folks who are doing this work to acknowledge the ways in which they are still performing whiteness and to ask like, what does that mean and what does that look like? Especially because in this country, what whiteness is continues to change and shift, although there are these underlining themes um, that accompany them. And I think too, particularly around white folks and reparations, um, I think that when it comes to fear, folks have to unpack. Right. And so folks have to unpack um, their history and what they've carried with them and what they're also still carrying with them. And what has happened is that there's been a lot of white silence and black folks particularly have continued to unpack for white people. Right. So when we're in spaces with white folks, there are these moments that emerge where we begin to be the teachers instead of space being held to center our stories. Right. Or whatever it is we want to be centered because we have to do this work of unpacking and still remaining as human as possible so it's palatable right um and so and i just find that in my work sometimes right um and so i think that when i think of, for example my work um as president of coming to the table that there are folks who come to the table who don't come from people who enslave folks right and so sometimes folks are like what is my work to do and i'm like what about the silence of the family in which you came from that these conversations didn't occur within your family. Where, what schools did they decide to send you to? Where did they decide to shop in the community? What church did they decide to attend? That all of that is about the legacy of silence, whether or not your family enslaved um, continental African folks, right? And so I think there are just two things that white folks are constantly performing whiteness and they need to like examine that. I don't think that is my work to do for white people. Um, I felt like I've been a little bit too much to the point where it's, probably not that good for my soul. And then I think um, there is unpacking for white folks to do when it comes to reparation. So there are white folks who come really interested in reparation. And then when they get told that there's work for them to unpack, begin to have that fear, right? Because now there are other things that need to be seen and need to be examined in which they never had to look at before. Because the ignorance around reparations is that it's only monetary. And, and the way in which white folks view that is still bounded by white supremacy and capitalism, right? So there isn't even an expansive view of like how we are looking at wealth, how we are looking at economic dignity, that it only ends with this kind of check and erasure of the kind of mass amounts of violence perpetuated against black folks in this country. So I think it's, folks can sometimes come, they're like, yeah, reparations, I'm with that, I got money to give. And when folks recognize that there is more work to do, I think a fear, which on, on some level, I'm just gonna keep it real, I think it's like false, like it's self-protecting, right? That like, if I can say I'm afraid, um, I'm, I move slower, right? It, it, it's a barrier to, to naming the truth because I'm so stuck in talking about this fear that I'm not talking about the reality in which folks are experiencing and the reality in which I've contributed to because now fear takes center stage and not the narratives, narratives and stories that we are continuing to amplify and uplift um, on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, panelists, does anyone else have anything else to add about the, what the fear of the reparations conversation is? Uh, I would. Oops. Sorry. Um, making too much noise here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, first I want to apologize because I didn't 
realized the meeting was going beyond 1.30, so I wanted to say what I have to say now and really deeply apologize about that. Um, I, so, I, you know, related to what I was saying before, I think the fear and the obstacles that have to do with people not accepting the burden of harming are directly related to people feeling helpless because there is no way for them to make good the magnitude of what they have done. And this, I think, is what Minister Dawson was saying in a way, that when people have to confront the enormity of the trauma, they feel so overwhelmed, they don't understand what is going to be the way that they are going to make that change. And so I think that we also have to pull in, in some way, the appeal to the big institutions. You know what I mean? Like at some point, <laughs> it has to be political and we have to be able to say, this is not just something that you as an individual have to do. And this isn't even just something that your small faith group is going to do. This is something that the United States government is responsible for and has to take on. So I'm kind of inclined to say that we have to have like both levels meet, like the level where people unpack and the level where people talk about their fears and <clears throat> admit their feelings of guilt. That's like one side, but the other side is we have to push for a certain kind of political power on this so that people don't imagine that they, as, I mean, I can feel this way sometimes, like what, how am I gonna make this all change? You know, you have to feel like there's gonna be a movement, there's gonna be a demand and we're gonna push for this. Otherwise, people are, they're being asked to do something that doesn't even really make sense to them, but also there, there isn't enough spiritual energy. So the spiritual energy that we were talking about, the spiritual energy of healing, we need to believe that it can be public. Like, uh, public about Amada Zekela, the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa always talks about the idea of making public spaces intimate so that we really join our most intimate uh, needs for healing with what we do out there in the public and what we demand politically. If I could just add, this is Zohara. I agree. Am I able to, Asia? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I agree with you, Jessica. I think that it's a very small major, a minority of white Americans who think that they, that they feel guilty or think that they owe anything, because I don't think that we have a large number of people who feel that way. Uh, and I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but of course, if you don't think you uh, have done wrong, then you are not all your ancestors and I totally agree with you that this is systemic and that it requires uh, the development of power, political power, uh, to uh, get the United States government to admit to its uh, wrongs and to be uh, willing to make amends. I like some of the uh, suggestions made by Minister Dawson uh, in terms of uh, housing, and, and I'd add to that free education, K through 16, uh, uh, housing uh, monies that are not loans that have to be paid back, uh, things of that nature. We, we must have uh, huge solutions because we're talking about gross disparities in wealth, uh, in our school systems, et cetera. Uh, and I think when we remember in the civil rights movement, the people in the South who were forced to make changes, they didn't do it because they had been convinced that the system of Jim Crow was wrong. The federal government forced them to change. Now we know that a lot 
didn't happen and that many of those people, especially the one or 10%, continued working to undermine what the civil rights movement had done. But it wasn't that people uh, were, oh my God, we've done these people wrong, we must end Jim Crow. No, it didn't happen yeah. that way. They were forced to end it. And of course, because their hearts and minds were not changed, they organized to undermine the laws that had been put in place that forced them to change some of the most uh, egregious uh, and public uh, and legal discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we're going to close this in uh, this, this section of the panelist discussion. Um, we're gonna um, give it over to David for some announcements and then we're gonna end in prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you all. This was a, an amazing conversation. Uh, and, and I wanna just point out respond to um, Dr. Simmons and, and um, Dr. Jennifer. Um, you know what, I think one of the reasons why we're here and particularly here for this campaign is because we do believe that the, the issue of slavery and reparations for it is a systemic issue, but it is also personal. It's interpersonal because slavery created the world in which we live in today. And so that means that there, there are the white folks who are here benefited from the world that slavery set up. So the reason why it's important to talk about both interpersonal and systemic is because the government listens when people act. And so what does it mean to put our spiritual feet to the ground and act in ways that are consistent with the change necessary involved in repair? And so this is why I like the, the UN definition of reparations, particularly the one that is focused on um, how individuals um, can be a part of it and one that is focused on the healing piece, right? The, the physical and the mental, but also the restitution, which is a return of what was stolen. Um, satisfaction, which is apologies, commemorations, education, um, uh, but also compensation and then guarantees of non-repeat. What does it mean for us to not repeat on an interpersonal level? What has happened? And for me, that means us in our spiritual communities, working on each other's hearts and minds, working on each other's hearts and minds in ways that tie our personal salvation to what we do down here for real. And we can do something about it on a personal level. And I always say like guarantees of non-repeat for me, they look like, how am I behaving personally? What am I invested in? Am I invested in things like um, stocks that see our kids, um, companies that see our kids, kids at the border in prison because it's a company behind that and somebody's making money from it. Or those who see our black kids in prison. There are people who make money off of prison beds. There are people who make money off of prison food. We have to divest from injustice and from whiteness. That is our part. And the government doesn't change until we do. And that's the truth. And so I just wanna thank everybody for being here. I also want to um, thank our host and hostess um, for 
uh, facilitating this call. And I want to point out that after this call, we'll be taking this recording and sending it out uh, in an email. We're gonna, you know, edit it a little bit and um, get off the rough edges. <laughs> Thank you all for being here um, for, for that. And a lot of you are planning to have conversations in your communities around the country. And we're calling this a night of a thousand conversations. And we learned that from the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation who used a night of a thousand conversations to initiate the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You'll get that and be able to have a conversation. Um, you'll get this video um, and maybe you can use a piece of what was said to start the conversation. Also, I wanna remind you that today, uh, some of the people from our communities are in Washington, D.C., speaking before a congressional hearing um, about reparations. Y'all, we are living in amazing and important and difficult times. But I think that sometimes the difficulty comes with hope. And we have to take it. And I'm gonna pause there and just let you know that as you begin this important spiritual journey between now and August 11th, the first national day of reparations for spiritual and faith communities, I want you all to know that we will be walking with you. This is a difficult walk, but I, I think that this is where we begin. We start off small and we spiral out. And I'm so thankful to be on this journey with you all. And um, Brother Minister Dawson, do you, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, yes, thank you Absolutely. so much. Uh, yes, we'll do this uh, closing prayer. Please, thank you. Well, first and foremost, blessings to everyone that attended the call as we move forward in our quest for reparations and spiritual growth. Let the ancestors guide us, mind, body, and spirit. Let us continue to fight for what is owed with tenacity, with strength, and with endurance allow the blessings of abundance and prosperity, peace of mind, clarity, and vision to be given to us. We thank you. We praise the ancestors for their due diligence, for their strength and courage, and let it be as we move forward in our grasp, let us feel what reparations is. Let us know that everything for a reason and this, what we will, what we will get, <laughs> what we will achieve will be the bounty of that, the blessing of what was of, of what transpired in the past we thank you we praise you may the ancestors bless you and keep you ashe <laughs>